I have been told that my voice is very feeble and the, the back benches cannot hear me properly, so I invite you to come to the front or else I try my best, but I might not last for the next 45 minutes. So we, well, first of all, thanks for staying with me. Um, let's discuss a couple of examples from the invertebrate and chordate world before we then delve into the vertebrate world uh, as of tomorrow. The first example I would like to discuss, not by giving you a full account of the very complicated and very efficient immune system of flies, the most famous representative of which, of course, is Drosophila, not the least of which because several Nobel Prizes have been given for work on this tiny little creature that normally is considered to be a complete nuisance. But I would like to highlight one particular aspect of this, uh, of, uh, of Drosophila's immune system that is at the same time very controversial. Because many people struggle to repeat initial findings and you might say, well, it's all based on bad foundations or it's just a complicated system and we haven't been able to manage it properly, experimentally to come at uh, definitive conclusions. So you have on this slide here that I took from my colleagues Littman and Cooper, a review they wrote a couple of years ago, that there are two aspects that I would like to address in Trisophila, one is the famous Toll receptor, and you must have heard of Toll-like receptors in the immune system of almost any organism that you have encountered. And the discovery of the first vertebrate Toll-like receptor that is important in regulating the immune response to certain types of bacteria was recognized with the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. That was Toll-like receptor 4, recognizing or interacting with um, a particular sub, uh, component of the bacterial wall, LPS, lipopolysaccharide. But I'm not talking about Toll-like receptors. They are too famous to be discussed here. I will be di dis discussing a rather ill-known process that people have implicated in the immune function of uh, certain types of arthropods to which Drosophila belongs, and that is RNA processing of a gene that is called DSCAM, Down syndrome cell adhesion molecule. Simply, it, it has got its name from a phenotype that was observed in flies, and that phenotype was that the nervous system did not wire up properly. As you know, when you think about the nervous system, it's even more complicated than the immune system. Cells have to make connections and have to build the right connections and the right network, otherwise the, the, the nervous system will not work properly. And this molecule, DSCAM, is involved in wiring the, immune, uh, the, the, the nervous system of the fly. And it has its name from uh, the, the human disease or syndrome, Down syndrome, because the human homologue of that gene is located on chromosome 21, and as you know, this is triplicated in Down syndrome's patients, although the function of this in that syndrome, the function of this gene in that syndrome is not known. But because it functions in the nervous system in the fly, there was some, some, some inference that perhaps it also might work in the nervous system of humans and thereby somehow mediate the ill effects of the Down syndrome. But it has a very interesting characteristic in arthropods. And this is this one. It is expressed in a number of tissues, not only in the nervous system, but also in cells that are normally considered to be part of the insect's immune system. And these cells are called hemocytes or the fat body. And many principles that we will discuss later about communication between cell types and tissues in the immune system are already present in these relatively small creatures. So the fat body, for example, produces antimicrobial peptides, essentially in response, for example, to engagement of this toll-like receptor that I mentioned before in the fly. 
And this toll like receptor is a multifunctional uh, 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 protein. It functions during embryogenesis, but it also functions later in, mediate, in mediating immune response in a rather nonspecific fashion. But it sets free or it sets in motion the production of antimicrobial peptides that are made in copious amounts, and they are, as the name would suggest, uh, bad for bacteria infecting the, the fly, and sometimes it can fend off infections. Hemocytes are also a class of cells roaming the hemolymph in the, in the fly, and they also can recognize foreign substances, either unorganic or living, and try to either encapsulate or in, in other ways inactivate these foreign invaders. And now, interestingly enough, both in the fat body and in the hemocytes, two key tissues for the immune system of the fly, it was found as it was found in the nervous system beforehand, that this DSCAM gene gives rise to thousands of different isoforms. You might have heard about this. And this works by RNA splicing of alternative forms. And the way it normally works, as you know, when there is a gene, the gene is broken up into various exons. Exons are encoded in these individual bits in the genome. The RNA, the primary RNA, is then cut into pieces. These exons are joined together during the process of co that is called RNA splicing, and then the RNA is functional and it can be translated. Now, this splicing can, of course, be differential or alternative, and by this we mean that some exons are used in some RNAs, and other exons are used in other RNAs. And this DSCAM molecule has a very neat system of making many different types of RNAs by using the following trick. It amplifies the copy number of three or rather four exons to many fold. Exon four comes in 12, in 12 types. Exon 6 in 48, exon 9 in 33, and exon 17 in 2. And each time an RNA is spliced from this gene, only one of these four alternatively spliced exons is used. So, first time round, you use version 1 of exon 4, version 20 of exon 6, version 10 of 9, and version 2 of 17, perhaps. Next time round, you use a different combination. So each time there's only one version of 4, one version of eight, or 6, 9, and 17. But because you have so many choices, you can quickly calculate it goes up to about 30,000 different isoforms that you can make. And because each, each exon makes a different protein, this one gene, through a very tiny expansion of coding capacity, not the entire gene, but just bits in between, can make many, many different proteins. And that is very reminiscent of the process that I alluded to in the beginning of somatic diversification in our immune system, to make many out of one forms. No, 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 this, this, no, this is not a toll-like -like receptor, no, no. This gene is activated in the response of engagement of the receptor, of the toll-like receptor. But it itself encodes a receptor at the cell surface. It? Uh, it doesn't belong to the family. No, 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 no. It's entirely different. You can see the, the structure here. It's, it's in the immunoglobulin domains and the fibronectin like domains. It's structurally different from the Tolak receptor, which is composed of loose and rich repeats. We will discuss that a little later. Now, what people found was, and that really raised their eyebrows, was that there is differential use of these different isoforms. And you can see that down here. So here is a way of highlighting the expression of different isoforms in different cells. And here, two cell types, the brain and the hemocytes, are compared. The brain is in green, the hemocytes are in red, and when the gene is expressed in both tissues, then the spot is yellow, there is overlap. And you can see there are some red spots, some green spots, many mostly yellow, but there are some that seem to be tissue specific. And that was sort of interesting. Then people compared fat body and brain, and what is not on here, also fat body and hemocytes, and there were lots of differences. And you can tell already here that there is, must be differences between fat body and hemocytes because the pattern 
against always the brain is not the same. And that was discovered by Dietmar Schmücker, and he reckoned that this somatic diversification might be used by these flies in immune recognition and in fighting invading bacteria. And in support of this, he published this experiment here. And the only thing you have to look at is this, what is down here. So what he used, he generated in the test tube different isoforms of this DSK molecule and then tested them for reactivity against certain bacteria. And the argument was, if there is some specificity in these different isoforms, some would re react with bacterium A, others with B and C. So there would be a differential binding capacity of these different isoforms to different bacteria. And this is what he seems to suggest from this experiment. It's very easy to see. You don't have to see the details. The numbers are somewhat different. And you recognize that the binding pattern, which is indicated by a shift in fluorescence measured here in the flow cytometer, indicates that this particular bacterium recognizes or binds to these different isoforms in different fashion. So the red doesn't bind very well, the green and the blue bind very well. So that was used as an argument to say that there is some specificity. And the story continued in a different arthropod. And you can see that here in mosquitoes, obviously a very important vector for some very important diseases that also affect humans. And what people have recognized, and that is, oh, you can't see that now here. It's by a group led by, uh, I think George's name is Dimopoulos. And what they have found is, again, mosquitoes have a similar structure. The numbers of individual alternatively spliced exons is somewhat different, as you can see. But nonetheless, there is this differential usage, the formation of different isoforms. And now what he found was, and that was the the finding, I think, that really set the field on fire, that when he infected these creatures, the mosquitoes with E. coli, Staph aureus, or stimulate them with LPS, lipopolysaccharides, or a non-vital uh, substance, or he used various uh, plasmodia, he saw that the composite expression of these different isoforms was always different. And you can see that here from the color. So this means very much induced, not much induced. So when there is a difference between the uninfected animal, there is a change in color. So if there is no change, then it would be, would be black. And you can easily see, for example, when you infect with E. coli, this particular isoform, and he only measured this particular uh, first uh, part of the diversified repertoire. This is underrepresented, and some others are overrepresented. Likewise, when he infects with stuff aureus, this one is all of a sudden overrepresented, and you can go through this column, and the different colors simply indicate to you that different infections or stimuli elicit a different response. Now, this was interpreted as a adaptive response. Now, what would you say now, having heard to what I said in the first hour? Is that a valid conclusion? Imagine yourself being the referee of that manuscript. That manuscript being sent to you, you should give your comments on this conclusion. An adaptive response, depending on the infection with different stimuli, and this is the outcome. The hemocytes produce a different repertoire of these different isoforms. So who has the guts to say something? You probably would want to test the different individuals to see if it's like genetically determined or it's, you know, the, in each case it's, it's decided in its own. Because, I mean, if it's genetically determined, you would see the same isoforms breaking to the same, uh, same pathogens. If it's, you know, the not just genetically determined, you might see differences in different study individuals. Like yes, that is a very good experiment. There's another good experiment one could do. 
But that would not eliminate if it comes out as you would perhaps hope that each individual responds in the same way, it would seem as if there is an adaptive response. But what is the, the trivial explanation? The trivial explanation is that the bacteria simply kill all the bacteria that have a certain isoform, because they can bind and kill. And this is why there is differential appearance. There is nothing to do with an adaptive response or alternative splicing induced by these different stimuli, it's simply selective killing. Okay? And that was not considered in the paper, and this is why this paper raised a lot of concerns, and this poor man was really quite heavily, and I think rightly so, attacked for this conclusion. There is no sign of adaptivity here. Well, it might well be, but this is not necessarily so. And this is how the field stands at the moment. So this is for you to clarify. But nobody has checked if it's true, if the bacteria kills the, these forms? This is very difficult to do, because you have to be able to build a system whereby you can watch, the ad and this is all in adults, the adult animal, and watch and track individual cells. And there are not very many hemocytes in flies, maybe a thousand in the uh, adult uh, uh, fly, so it's very difficult to do this. And what is more, not oh, each cell expresses many different isoforms. And I was coming to this when I was discussing this slide. That is a very important parameter that will feature quite prominently a bit later in the series that it makes a big difference whether a cell, an immune cell, expresses many different seemingly specific receptors or only one of the type that are somatically diversified. Some of you who are perhaps a bit advanced in immunological studies know that our lymphocytes, for example, always express, well, to a first approximation, a single antigen receptor either a B cell receptor or a T cell receptor of a single specificity and not many. That is called monoallelic expression or monospecific expression and that is a very important feature of all vertebrate lymphocytes and we will discuss possible reasons why that might be so. But that is not the case in arthropods. So that is very difficult to see because many hemocytes express or each hemocyte expresses many different isoforms, and then it's technically difficult to follow them in the intact organism. But how, how does it depend on the concentration of bacteria? Maybe it depends, so you can judge that way? Um, well, that is of course true. You have, for, for these kind of experiments, the bacteria are artificially injected into the hemolymph, and then, and then you try to follow them. But that is very difficult to get the multiplicity of infection right. And again, the problem remains, you might say, okay, the overall outcome I can measure when I inject 10 bacteria or 1,000 bacteria, that is well be so. But because there is only 1,000 hemocytes, then it becomes a numbers game and it's very difficult to examine. So the long and short of it is, it's an interesting problem but technically difficult to study. And I'm not responsible, fortunately, for these experiments, so I can leave it at that quite safely. But you actually, I mean... Oh, you're, not, you're not giving up now, huh? Right, they actually had not just bacteria, but also just molecules, like proteoglycan or LPS, yes. right? Yes, so yes. The explanation is that, in this case, is these molecules were just toxic for certain types. Exactly, of exactly, yes, yes. So now, of course, that was very interesting. So I wasn't convincing. Now the first people leave, you see. So that, that was so exciting for people that they started looking which other species also have that particular type of mechanism. And here is one that is Daphnia. And some people might know about Daphnia. They have a very interesting ecology and population structure and people work on a great many of evolutionary questions about this. Daphnia also has this. And now people are trying to study whether modifications in this gene or in the use of these differential exons in one way or another influence population structure. Because it might well be that modifications that you have in these things, you, you now in, you understand the, the, the design of this, um, 
that this might have an influence on population structure, not so much on the individual response, but because there is genetic polymorphism in these individual exons, it might influence population structure. So not so much focusing on the individual in this case, but rather on the population. But what is important about this type of somatic modification? When you think about it, each exon and each sequence of each exon is selected on an evolutionary time scale, that is, by Darwinian selection. Because if there is one exon here, let's say this fifth exon in this first, uh, in this first group, in the red group, that is dysfunctional, or indeed if all of them are dysfunctional, this gene is not very useful, and it will be eliminated from the gene pool in the population. So, because RNA splicing is a faithful representation of what is in the genome, because as you know, they are splice sites, so you can exactly predict what the junction is like between two exons. You know where the exon ends, you know where the exon begins, they come together, and you can exactly predict what the junction is. And if the exon intron boundary is within a codon, even then you can predict what the resulting codon is. And because Darwinian evolution operates not on gene sequence, but on protein sequence. And because in this case, somatic diversification directly translates from gene sequence into protein sequence, it can be selected by Darwinian selection. And that, I want you to remember this, because that will change dramatically when we discuss other forms of somatic diversification. So in this RNA and RNA splicing process, it's entirely predictable from the genomic sequence what the protein will look like. No surprises. And just another question regarding the previous slide. And if bacteria kills something, then you will see only the degrees of expression of some proteins. Yes. But if we see an increase of production, then this uh, statement doesn't hold true. Yeah but, yeah, but that is now misleading because that's comparing to the undisturbed situation. So there is a relative increase when one species is lost. To kill all the other guys, putting the other types. Then, relatively speaking, the others but can, increase. Can we measure absolute numbers? Yes, that's, measured, that's measuring absolute numbers. It's direct comparison. Okay, so. If I give each of you five euros and I eliminate eight, then all the rest will get much more. So that's basically the logic. So now, what a, a big argument against the importance of this particular type of modification in the immune system and maybe also for the, for the nervous system is that this diversification system is present only in a certain subgroup of um, species. So it's not something that is so useful that it's been invented and then carried on into other walks of life, as it were. So when you look at the vertebrate deer scams, they have a duplication of the gene, but there is no sign of differential splicing. And the differential splicing basically happens down here in a very small group of arthropods even. So this seems to be a specialized solution. And this is another thing I want you to remember. There must be some evolutionary pressure on dealing with the outside world for each species or each individual. And there are many different solutions. And that will feature very prominently when we discuss different types of immune systems in vertebrates. So we should not always think that each species has the same solution. And when there was a solution, it would, would be carried forward. Not necessarily so. So there are some idiosyncratic situations that are useful as models, but not necessarily um, function as general principles. They are simply examples of a design of an immune system. And that will be also an important point that I will repeatedly make, we should consider design, not the precise mechanism, because often the design is, is the same, but the mechanism is different. Indicating, when you think in evolutionary terms, of course, that this is an independent origin. Now we leave the flies. They gave, made an appearance for a quarter of an hour. 
Now we move to snails. And there was some interesting work done on snails that again was reminiscent of something that we knew about from the immune system of higher vertebrates. And that is somatic diversification by a process that is, in our case, as it were, referred to as somatic hypermutation. Now, you all know when DNA is copied, when a cell divides, the system needs to balance the possibility of making mistakes to allow selection to operate and faithful copying of a tried and tested set of genetic information. So it's no point in increasing your diversity by sloppy replication because you might just create problems. And normally mutations are more likely to be deleterious than advantageous. So it's good to have a very good copying rate. Some genetic systems don't operate like this. Think of retroviruses. Retroviruses made a habit of mutating very rapidly because this allows them to evade the immune system. And here is one system that gives us an indication that somatic hypermutation might already exist in very primordial forms and might have to do with the arms race that I mentioned in the beginning. So here are some strange molecules called fibrinogen-related proteins in this particular type of snail. And they were found to hypermutate. And that was discovered by sequencing RNA from uh, uh, somatic tissues of these snails and comparing the sequence that one obtained from these somatic tissues against the germline. So that is the genetic information that's passed on through the germ cells. And it was found that there was a higher than expected uh, difference in genetic sequences. So the first thought, of course, is you made some technical error or you have unwittingly discovered a gene family that you did not know about and this is just different forms of it. Or, and that is the more likely explanation here, you are generating different allelic forms in the soma. So you have one template, simply speaking, and by copying it sloppily or targeting sloppy replication to this particular locus in the soma, in a particular type of cell, you are creating changes in the protein constitution. And if I now tell you, and this is just a summary here, that these FREPs have a very high rate of polymorphism and they bind to proteins of a parasite that infects these snails, and you will recognize the name. Now I have to, here, schistosoma, again a very important human parasite, and these snails are the intermediate hosts. So this schistosoma also has a system of evading immune responses, not so much in the snail, but more to evade immune response in the vertebrate host. And they create what are called polymorphic mucins. Again, diversification in the soma, and this is the way the parasite, when it replicates in the vertebrate host, tries to avoid immune attack. So it has a certain form at one stage, immune system is activated, tries to target it, but then the parasite changes the outside surface, and then it evades in the next stage the immune attack. So it really goes into the, into the void. And what was found, and this is why I was summarizing it, otherwise the data would have been too complicated, what was found is that the degree of polymorphism of these FREPs, of these fibrinogen-like related proteins in the mollusk, in the intermediate host, directly correlate with the extent of diversity of these mucins of the parasite. And what's more, it was found that these fibrinogen-like uh, related proteins bind directly to these polymorphic mucins. So there we have now physical interaction between a protein of the host, a protein of the parasite, and capping the parasitic protein is detrimental for the reproduction of the schistosoma. Now the schistosoma 
developed this system to mutate its structure so that these fraps always come late. Okay, so there is no Promethean anticipation. It mutates when it is infected and it always comes a little late. But because that is, of course, a random choice process, there is some mutual co-evolution between the parasite and the host, as I explained very generally and abstractly in the beginning. And this, what can I say, this co-diversity in a host protein that binds to a parasite protein and the parasite protein by itself diversifying is indicative of a somatic diversification process or a somatic version of this host parasite co-evolution. In the beginning, I was portraying it as if this is Darwinian. So you, you have a set of genes encoded in your germline. They either work or they don't. And now we have a modification to the theme. We are doing somatic or we are making somatic mutants. And that can help us fend off or keep in check the number of parasites, Alexei. Are there and snails make sure that they don't recognize the self proteins? Uh, how that work in there? How they discriminate between self and non-self? Is it an evolutionary basis? Like those which recognize self, they are eliminated by evolution. Or? Yeah, but because that is somatically diversifying, the snail runs the risk of attacking its own tissues. If the, so if the you could you could make the it hasn't been studied in this context because that's a very recent sort of development, but you can make the argument that perhaps there is a trade-off. So the population of snails decides we will mutate. We will probably lose some of our members because they unwittingly will attack self. Bad luck for them. But as a population, we can survive. OK, so this is cooperative <laughs> behavior in certain ways. So are those FREPS molecules, are they kind of clonal? Like each cell expresses only one type of FREP, or is it? Not known. OK. <laughs> Key question, yes. Yeah key question. So we leave the snails because now we know about somatic diversification by RNA splicing. And RNA splicing can exactly predict what the structure is. Somatic hypermutation in whatever mechanism it occurs produces unpredictable structures with the risk of autoimmunity as we are like as we, we like to call it or autoaggression or whatever word you find for it. Or you could might simply say, bad luck. But in general, that system must have been advantageous, otherwise it wouldn't have survived. Now let's move to another creature, a bit more developed, a protochordate, Amphioxus or Lancelet. And this was also found to have very interesting complement of immune-related molecules. And I'm picking just one because I'm trying to make or expand the argument that I just made a bit further and then give at least or whet your appetite for tomorrow. Otherwise, nobody will be sitting here. So what one has found is that in the population, on a population basis, of this particular species and several types of species of this of Ampioxus have been studied, and you will not be able to read this. But what was found is that in a particular type of gene or group of genes that are called variable chitin binding proteins, VCBP, that these proteins have a very high level of polymorphism in the population. And you of course know what happens when a gene has many different alleles. Think of MHC. Because there are many alleles, each sexually reproducing pair produces a new combination of these alleles, okay, by necessity. If there is only one, one allelic form, of course, it will be all uniform. But if there are many different alleles, the chances that two um, individuals have the same complement is relatively low. The higher the frequency and, and magnitude of different alleles, the, the smaller the, chance, the chances that you have the same genetic composition. So this is basically what it shows here. All these different colors simply mean different types of alleles. Okay. So it's, this is simply to show and give you the impression, it's worked by Gary Littman from Florida, that these molecules can be very different 
in, varied, in, in, in different individuals. So now this is a different kind of diversification. It's not somatic, but it now sort of increases diversity by simply generating multi-allelic uh, genetic uh, loci. We are normally used to relatively low polymorphism. We know about MHC, which is hyperpolymorphic, and a hyperpolymorphic locus in evolutionary thinking is often uh, involved in immunological response. And so is this one, the VBCP, of all, although this is not clearly shown directly because it's very difficult to manipulate these uh, creatures genetically, this is indicative or at least suggestive of their role in the immune system. Now, another in important concept I would like to introduce with this is the following. What was found is that these VBC, uh, VCPPs are secreted into the extracellular space, and in this case, the extracellular space also encompasses the gut, the gut lumen. Now, that, of course, is very interesting, because as you know, no multicellular organism lives without its symbionts. So we have different kinds of bacteria living on our skin, on the different types of mucosa, and we, ha we form a happy metagenomic uh, organism, a superorganism in certain ways. Our immune system has come to be a dependent on the presence of these symbionts, because when you, for example, raise a germ-free vertebrate, a mouse, for example, for humans this is not possible, but for a mouse, then the immune system is not fully developed. So, and at the same time, these germs, as you might call them, or these symbionts, produce very important substances that we quite happily consume. Think of vitamin K, the classic example. So when a, a, a human being is born and it's not colonized rapidly enough with colonic bacteria that produce vitamin K, the problem is that, you can, that this baby can suffer from severe bleeding. So now in the civilized world, each newborn is now given a shot of vitamin K just to be on the safe side. That was a very important problem in the old days, as it were. Many babies were uh, uh, coming down to severe bleeding because the colonization was either delayed or not functioning properly and not enough vitamin K was made. That is produced by bacteria that colonize our gut. So that is just one example, there are many more, just one example why it is important to be colonized and to live in happy conjunction with your symbionts. And now there is a, a very lively debate now. What came first? Colonization by symbionts? Or did the immune system perhaps, in one way or another, facilitate colonization by symbionts? Now, in principle, a bacterium that is ingested and colonizes my gut is potentially dangerous. You would probably agree. So, one has to find ways of tolerating the good guys and trying to contain or get rid of the bad guys. And there is this idea now that molecules of the immune system help in striking that balance. And it must have begun at some point and people are now considering molecules that are either hyperpolymorphic or hyperallelic, like these VCBPs here, have a role in managing, that is kind of a loose term, non-specific term, managing our symbiotic um, um, friends. Let's call them friends, because they're symbionts. And the way this was shown here, you probably can't see this from the end, but this is now what people have tried to demonstrate is that the gut bacteria in Amphioxus are coated by these VCBPs. And the argument goes that because these VCBPs are structurally diverse, they can coat these symbionts, and each structure codes a different one, in very simple uh, reasoning. And because you are multi-allelic, you can generate, and even if it's a multigenic thing, you can generate then different compositions of colonizing symbionts. This coating somehow 
marks them as friends of the host. They are not attacked, they are tolerated, and then you can build these relationships. Because that is very clear in general terms, although in this particular case the mechanistic understanding is very poor. But when you think about it, it's very clear that there must be molecules telling the host what kind and what number of symbionts it has in its colonies and the other way around. This is called quorum sensing or has many different names in many different circumstances, but essentially it requires communication between the host and the symbiont. And that might be one way of doing it. The, the, the diverse molecule here might tell the symbiontic population, as it were, you are tolerated. Our allelic series, our structural polymorphism has been selected to preferentially bind and colonize and help and foster these good guys because in return they might produce some interesting molecule. Certainly not vitamin K in that case, but some other molecule or some other intermediate metabolite that the host might like and might not be able to synthesize itself. And now comes efficiency again. If there is co-evolution now between symbionts and the host and vitamin K is made by bacteria, we cannot live without them because without vitamin K we will be dead. We will not be able to reproduce. So at the expense of producing an immune system that is diverse, five more minutes I have, that, that is diverse, we can now build a symbiotic relationship and at the same time save genetic capacity, as it were. We don't have to maintain or retain the biosynthetic pathways, or rather the genes that direct this biosynthetic pathway to make vitamin K. We've basically now told somebody else to do it. Okay? So that is a very feasible economic strategy, as you know. This is invented and, used to, and, and put to much use by the capitalist system. And that is already foreshadowed here in nature. You simply delegate certain functions, you can save energy. This is a just-in-time production of Porsches. And this is the schematic underlying this. The argument goes that as the immune system was capable of making more and more complex, structurally diverse molecules, it managed to make many more or build many more and more complex symbiotic populations. So here this is, our, let's say, the beginning. The VCBPs, they are not very diverse. And in support of this thinking, or rather stimulated by this finding, was that the, the, the diversity of these symbionts in Amphioxus are not very species rich. So they are very sparse and very arid. By contrast, the types of species that live in our gut are very diverse. And it has been shown experimentally that one particular type of immunoglobulin by the name of IgA, and we come to this a bit later, you simply take the name for it now, IgA is a diverse immunoglobulin that is secreted into the gut. It's also secreted into the breast milk. That this immunoglobulin, or it's rather its diversity, is important to build this species-rich microbiome that inhabits our uh, intestine. And the summary here is that we have different forms of diversification mechanisms. Some are somatic, some are germline, but are using alle allelic diversity. And that some of these mechanisms either deal with fending of parasites or indeed are employed in building this superorganism that already began to be built up here, certainly in these chordates, and that might have been a theme that, that was translating into uh, higher vertebrates. And I end by making a comment about what I just mentioned in passing. IgM in the gut, determining the diversity of our flora, and now think about horizontal transmission of somatic diversification. And how does that work? 
I gave you the buzzword. It's via breastfeeding. Because in breast milk, the mother produces all the IgAs that must have been useful. Otherwise, the mother wouldn't have survived into reproduction age. And this diversity of IgA, when it's given through the breast milk, basically preempts and primes the colonization of the intestine of the infant. And what it does, it basically relates the infant to the environment of the mother. Because we know from behavioral studies and from daily experience, when the baby is born, it lives with the mother. And it's not physically separated. So it makes sense if we have to build such a complex symbiotic relationship to jump start it with a tried and tested population of bacteria. So the IgA not only in the old sense of understanding the system is protecting against infections, it also jumpstarts and horizontally transfers somatic information that was selected in the mother and represented in this diverse IgA repertoire into the infant. So the infant then is colonized by only a subset of these bacteria that had proven useful for the mother. And with all likelihood, are of course also useful for the baby. So if you now breastfeed an infant from St. Petersburg with breast milk, if that were technically possible, with breast milk from, say, Central Africa, you might have a problem because the microbiome in St. Petersburg is almost certainly different from the microbiome in Central Africa. So it makes sense that this is a physical connection. And once this microbiome it has been established, it's very difficult to change. Okay? And that was my last word for today. Just hang on a second. Forgive me. Palchoye, spasiba, zavashye, vnimanye, dasaftra, vyechero. So Alexei has a question. How about babies that go without breastfeeding? Those could have chance to survive, right? Well, we know from yeah, we know the question was, why do babies survive that are not breastfed? That is basically a matter of chance whether you are generating a dysenteric, as it as it were, or a, 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 a population of bacteria that is prone to dysentery. When you don't breastfeed, then it's just which bacteria hit your gut first. If it's bad bacteria, you're in bad shape. If you happen to be hit by good bacteria, that's OK. And this is what every, every pediatrician knows, particularly true for the developing countries. Breastfeed your children. That saves a lot of trouble, not only for the family, but also for the baby, because that really puts the baby right into the right environment in terms of the immune system. Actually, is it really uh, any data that uh, AGMs are different in the no, breast, uh, in breast milk, IGM are different from you know, different countries or continents that is there? Is there any you know, experimental evidence? Yeah. Really happen? Yes, the, the, the question was, is there evidence for differences in terms of species composition between my intestine and, say, a Japanese intestine? Yes, there is. No, no, no. I'm talking about uh, you know, breast milk. Is there right? Oh, but, well, the, the divert, well, then we have to turn it, we have to phrase the question differently. The IgA composition of the mother is identical to the one that is in the breast milk. And because it's also secreted in the intestine, so that is would be equivalent. So, so th yeah, okay. So actually, when you talk about the horizontal transfer, you kind of stopped halfway. So you said it's from the the repertoire of IgA in mother's breast milk, then it results in the spectrum of uh, bacteria in the newborn's gut. It doesn't go the next step, like doesn't the, the, the doesn't shape the repertoire of IgA's in the newborn. Like exactly, because, and we come to this later, 
the immune system has to distinguish between good and bad. And if now the gut is colonized with supposedly good guys, of course there is selection of this gut microbiome on the adaptive response, as it were, of the new host. Okay? Very clever system when you think about it. And a very neat explanation now, a complicated explanation for some basic uh, and old observation. The repertoire of IgAs uh, in mother just tells the uh, baby uh, which uh, pathogens are bad, bacteria are bad. No, no, I think it tells the baby no, which no. bacteria are good because it, these IgAs select the colonization by a certain type of bacteria. So the mothers and the, bacteria, and the, bacteria, and, and the infant's intestinal composition is initially almost identical. So it's the IgA that positively selects. You, I would like you to stay. If there is a bad guy, a new bad guy, which you didn't occur to mother, let's see. Right. What is the, the question now is what happens if a bad guy comes? Yeah. And then we are back to a very simple means, that is competition. Because when the gut is colonized by good guys, there's very little room for bad guys. And bad guys have a very hard time to colonize our gut. And this is why it's not good for you to treat gut, well, in most instances, not good for you to treat gut infections with antibiotics, because then you kill off the rest of the good guys, and then the pathogens have a field day. So rather, this is now, although it seems a bit strange, now we are back to feeding, and in one re recent review I read, it says feeding the poop to reinstall a normal intestinal flora, as disgusting as it might appear. Yeah, but it can be the situation when the mother has initially the bad guys in her uh, gut, so it, uh, she transfers it to her children. Yes, but that doesn't nullify the, 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 the principle. There is, of course, a mother that is dysenteric when it gives birth to a baby, but then, in Mother Nature's words, I would say, too bad. Tough luck. Yeah. But that doesn't, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here. That does, that does not happen normally. Okay, thank you very much for coming and I hope to see you tomorrow.